Well, this is a very good representative. Yeah, that's a great tool. The soil health assessment, um, it takes into consideration what we know about soil health is that it's not just one thing. Right. It's the chemistry, the microbiology, and the physics of the soil. I want maximum growth, so I soil test every year just to confirm in my case, in this particular field here, hey Grant, you're good to go for another year because these practices, you may or may not need to add anything. The thing that kind of kicked me a little bit was this organic matter, 6.8%. Uh, as, as rocky of a soil that is, I could not believe it was 6.8% organic matter, but that is amazing. You may recall that recently the folks from Ward Labs, a big soil testing lab, they work all around the planet, literally came to the proving grounds and showed us the best way to take a soil sample. But pulling a good sample is the first part of that equation. Testing it and knowing what those results mean is the really important part. So we're blessed that they're gonna join us here in just a second via a Zoom call and go over our soil test results. Tell us what that means and how we can apply it to produce bigger deer and other critters. Hey guys, thanks for hopping on a call. Wish you were back here in the field with us, but I'm super excited to you know, get your understanding of the results. So we collected some samples in the field, actually shared how to do that, but what's it all mean? How's, how do I turn that information into growing bigger antlers and more fawns? How do I, how do I use this information? Well, that's a great question, Grant. Um, we are sad that we couldn't be down there with you this time, but I'm kind of grateful that I don't have ticks on me anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Patrick, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, yeah, so we're gonna go through the report and make sure that you understand all the different parts of it and what the takeaway is from this report. So going through the, uh, I guess the initial part of it is the soil char characteristics, which is sort of an initial kind of description of the soil itself. Okay. Um, as you know, from our uh, previous meeting, it, this is gonna cover the, the chemical, the biological and then the physical parts of the soil analysis. Yeah. Uh, and sort of the, the takeaways from that in terms of the, the soil health component. Yeah, and while I'm so excited about this, I think most labs I've dealt with anyway, I've been in a lot of universities and whatnot, only touch on the chemical. You know, so we're, we're, we're missing out a little bit, and I'm so excited to advance to basically better technology, right? We're basically taking what we've learned from those years of experience with that chemical side of things and, and going a couple steps past that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so take it away. Yep. So starting out with the pH. So we have about 7.2. This is a pretty optimal pH for most soils. Um, and unless you're in like an arid region or, you know, like a desert area or a high rainfall area, uh, you're typically going to be around a neutral pH if you aren't managing the soil that, you know, that closely, I guess. So this is a, a very optimal pH. It's perfect. But you probably couldn't get it any more perfect unless you're like 7.0, but this is dead on. <laughs> it's really good. So your excess lime rating, that is... Um, sort of the, the, the effervescence or what the carbonates in the soil, typically those carbonates will build up in like, you know, like a desert soil. So yeah. this is not a dirt, desert region. So you're not gonna have any carbonates in the soil unless it comes from the, the soil itself, which you don't. Sure. Um, it just kind of gives you an indication of some of those carbonates and the problems that they could kind of pose in some uh, nutrient management strategies. Uh, your EC, which is your salts, your electrical conductivity or your soluble salts, that's pretty critical. So if you get into a salty area, uh, you get into really big issues with water availability because those salts will pull the water away from the plant roots. It's yeah. kind of critical. I mean, that makes sense, right? Because we all know that we can use salt. Pe taxidermists use salt to dry moisture out of pelts when they're preparing pelts. Yeah. So same thing in the soil, right? If there's too many salts, it's going to compete for that water with the plant. Exactly, exactly. So anything over two in most of these reports, it's considered the high, high end. You don't want to be over two. Um, so anything between one and zero is kind of what I normally see in a wide range of soils across the U.S. Okay. Depends on the region, but you're at 0.24, which is like really good. It's quite okay. good. No yeah. problem at all there. Okay. The thing that kind of kicked me a little bit was this Organic matter, 6.8%. Uh, as, as rocky of a soil that is, I could not believe it was 6.8% organic matter, but that is amazing. Um, the, it just kind of proves that no matter where you are working, you can have a, a fertile, healthy, organic, organic matter rich soil. Right, based on your management practices, you can see how well you've been doing over, over your previous years and how that organic matter has, has improved. Yeah, so if, if you don't mind, I'd like to just share a couple things in hunter speak here. So. Basically, for each 1% of organic matter, the soil, and these are averages, there's all kinds of variables out there, can store about 20,000 gallons of water. So, gosh, when I've got a 6.8 rounding up to 7, I'm storing way over 100,000 gallons of water per acre. Now, 
that sounds like a flood. Remember that one inch of water, if you were to irrigate an inch, that's about 22,000 gallons. Uh, so, you know, you need to put that in scale. So I just got a half inch of rain. And as, as other people keep burning, other people like to say, it's not how much rain you get, it's how much you keep. And with these type of soils, like none's running off, right? It's going right in there like a sponge, if you will. Organic matter's kind of like a sponge. And it's not only holding moisture, it's holding nutrients, right? That's right. So the higher your organic matter almost always is a great indication of better quality soil and your crops are gonna go better. And we talked about plants being nutrient transfer agents. They take the nutrients out of soil and transfer them to the critter. And, and, and that critter in this case is deer and turkey and other wildlife. So these, this sponge is like a bigger tank. It can hold more nutrients, is, is that right? Yep, that's exactly right. And you'll see in some of the other nutrients that we're going to go through how that actually is affected by your high organic matter score. It's quite impressive. Again, for such a rocky soil, this is a pretty fertile, productive, uh, as we say, productive soil. So I'm probably going to ding you with this in a couple of times, but I believe I heard you say earlier offline that this was about as good as you see anywhere. Am I misquoting you? Oh yeah, yeah. So um, as, as in terms of the organic matter, in fact, uh, uh, in terms of the fertility and the productivity, this is a, probably a higher, higher than what I've seen in most places. Yeah. So all my Iowa buddies up there, all my Iowa buddies, all my Kansas buddies, just think down here in the Ozarks, the rock pit of the world. If you use a release process, you know you're planting good blends and you're not disking and just kind of following these simple steps, you can produce good soil and and therefore good critters. Yeah, and that's the, that's the key part is the, the disking part. You have to kind of leave the soil as is, let the system work for you, and let it kind of build up that productivity on its own. And it will, as you, as you see here. Well, and yeah. I know Patrick kind of left you with some bare dirt, but keeping that dirt, keeping that soil covered is key too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. Patrick doesn't give me ice cream when he comes back, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, let's keep going, guys. Yeah, so now we're going down to the what's called the base saturation. These are just uh, some of the, the, the nutrients, the bases, as, as we call them in soils, that the plants can access. So calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, the, the, the macro, some of the critical ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, typically, you want sort of a range in terms of the, these are the, the percents of those different uh, nutrients on the soil surface. And you want sort of an optimal range with the, the takeaway being the sodium, the salt being the lowest one. Yeah, uh, that okay. salt isn't really critical. Uh, you want uh, the calcium to be the highest, which it typically is about 80%, followed by magnesium and then potassium. Uh, and this looks really good. This is pretty much a, a normal profile from what I see. And then going down to the uh, modified aggregate stability. So our modified aggregate stability, you're at about 86% there. We've heard of other aggregate stability tests, which is basically how well your soil will hold together. Um, so we've created a modified version of that test in order to um, use the soil that you've sent in to us to give you basically a, a measure of, of what that would be. The aggregate itself is sort of uh, what I would say like the diamond in the palm of the hand is, is the system, if it's productive, if it's working together, the, the microbiology, the chemistry, and the phys physical parts of the soil, it's going to produce really good aggregation, great porosity, great rooting structure. 86% is excellent. It's really, really good. As, and we, we, you pointed out, out there uh, how the, the roots are stabilizing, uh, especially the areas that are inundated with water at yeah. points, how, how stable that, that system is. Yeah, so just before you, I shared this when you are in the field, just before y'all got here, we had almost five inches of rain, a, a, a big rain event. And so, you know, I think if we were in low quality soils, some of these nutrients would have leached, you know, somewhere down about China or somewhere like that, they'd leached right on through there. But in this case, even right after, with nothing added, of course, a five inch rain event, they're still there in that top few inches for the roots to be able to use. And that's due in part to, the, of course, the organic matter and that aggregate, it didn't hit and run off this way and there's enough structure in the soil that it didn't just go right through there. So the living roots and the, and the cover and the, and the stabilized soil, people don't realize that that rain itself can kind of damage soil a little bit, sure. erosion, things like that. But because it's such a, it's a pretty high force that's hitting the soil at that point, but your system is completely stabilized. 
There's no runoff. Um, there might be some soluble nutrients leaching out here and there, but it's continually being replenished by the system because it is how productive it is. And we saw that when we crossed the creek a few times driving around, there's no dirt, right? You see every, in the Ozarks, so it's a rock bottom. You can see every gravel through the water. Yep, the stream was, was clean and- yeah, Very clean. Very clean, very clean. and uh, everything was pretty much stabilized. So it was, okay. it was pretty nice. All right, let's move on then. That's awesome. So going into the water extractable components here. Uh -huh. So uh, the, the water extractable or the, what, what, what we kind of shake up with water for the soil and then we pull out and analyze it, that kind of shows uh, uh, quite a bit. So the chemistry and some of the microbiology. Um, what that means is it kind of relates a lot to the productivity, the fertility of the system on the basis of the microbes, what they're doing, uh, the, the food they have access to, the carbon and nitrogen, and how that sort of uh, goes into other components such as their respiration, their overall activity, things like that, their biomass. Going into the water extractable nitrate, um, your value is actually pretty good. Now, the, the nitrate is typically um, well, what the plants can access. So mm -hmm. you have your, uh, your, your unavailable form, organic nitrogen, then your available forms, which is you know, nitrate and ammonium. That's typically what a, what a lot of fertilizers come in as, so nitrate yeah. and ammonia. This kind of shows a very small part of your system is uh, sort of the inorganic leachable nitrogen source, which is actually really good. It's not, it really just varies with each system depending on the organic matter, uh, the, the cropping systems, uh, the microbiology of the system, things like that. But for the most part, you're not losing a lot from the system yeah. and whatever is there, it's going to be yeah, accurate. We just had that big rain. So we probably lost some, right? We just had five, think about five inches of water going through. Uh, we probably lost some, but we still have enough for it keeps plants growing. With, without, you know, me asking Miss Tracy for a loan so I can go buy some more fertilizer. Yep, <laughs> which is always good. <laughs> so uh, going into the, um, the phosphorus analysis. Um, so phosphorus, you know, for your ears, you have 68 parts per million. That's quite high. It relates a lot to the, the high organic matter. So that organic matter is kind of like a nutrient sponge. You know, it's going to hold a lot of nutrients. Phosphorus is a big one. You know, we're getting to talk to now about mining for having to mine for phosphorus. Uh, yeah, because, sure. You know, it's it's uh, going to be the next thing in line after the after nitrogen in terms of like the high cost of fertilizers. So it cost a lot. And I've read several reports that says you know we mine phosphorus physically mine phosphorus. I've worked on a phosphorus mine in Florida, and sadly enough, it's not owned by Americans. This is a very large land source. So if they said, hey no phosphorus for America, our farmers would practically be out of phosphorus. Yep. But if you can manage your soil right, and I've heard Mr. Ward, Dr. Ward say this in the past, if you manage your soil right, there's plenty of phosphorus there. You just have to make it available for plants. And there's probably a whole lot more there. This is what's plant available. Yeah, the reserve is usually in the thousands of PPMs, parts per million. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, the roots and the microbes, they'll, they'll free a lot of that up with what it needs. You won't get any more than that um, unless yeah. and whatever is there will be held by the organic matter. So it's, it's pretty much what you need right there. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So going on to the um, ammonium acetate extractables. Um, so we've got calcium, potassium, magnesium, and sodium. This is also related to the, uh, what we just spoke about, the base saturation percentages. This is just in the, in the milligrams per kilogram, but Typically for a lot of these salts, so calcium, magnesium, um, and then potassium, those are a lot of the macros that the plants take mm -hmm. up in large quantities. Mm -hmm. uh, they ate a lot in like uh, cellular functions, things like that. Uh, unless you get into systems where that's really deficient, you typically don't need to amend. Or if you need to you know, lime the soil, that's calcium right there. Sure. Like usually, you know, uh, the, the soil typically has quite a bit of that already. So. Yep. Yep. Man, that is great news. And, and again, folks, I'm looking at Rochelle Salt on screen, of course, but when I read down through this and I see even, you know, getting down some other stuff, the sulfates and whatnot, and I'm thinking, wow, I can remember the day that I used to pay a lot of money to put mineral blocks, mineral rocks, whatever, all throughout my farm, right? And I enjoyed it because deer come to it, they lick it back in the day for such good quality soil. And uh, put your troll camera there, get pictures of deer. But in several states now, including I'm in a CWD unit, chronic wasting disease, we're not allowed to put those attractants out for fear of deer being close together frequently and spreading it. Just like if little Johnny plays with the fire truck and he's got a snotty nose and then Sarah plays with it, she goes home sick too. Well, deer can spread diseases or, you know, stuff like that similarly. So with, that's why states have banned mineral licks, and more states will, trust me, more states will, because CWD is spreading. Uh, but when I look at this, 
it's hard to find a mineral product as good as this. And for example, I know as a deer biologist, to grow antlers, folks, deer tend to need calcium phosphorus about a two to one ratio. Two parts calcium to one part phosphorus, because that's what they end up in a hard antler, that's what ends up in there. So that's perfect for growing antlers. Not much makes a food plotter happier than here. That's perfect for growing antlers. That's like the key phrase right there, right? So, man, that makes me excited. So now we're gonna get into the micronutrients. Now, uh, this is where you really see the role of organic matter uh, in the soil, it's, which is uh, pretty amazing, I think. I love watching this on, on a lot of reports. Uh, especially with yours because your organic matter is so high. And again, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a rocky soil. Uh, so you would think that the micronutrient availability would be a little bit low, but you have some of the highest micronutrients that I've seen on a lot of reports, which is pretty amazing. So, and a lot of those come from the minerals. So whatever the roots can access, the rocks and everything, the microbe that will solubilize some of those minerals and let the organic matter kind of hold on to it. Your uh, zinc and iron, manganese and copper, those are some of the micros along with the sulfur. The sulfur is a little bit low, but that's really a function of, you know, the plant matter and then also the crop needs. So mm -hmm. um, people always ask about sulfur. You can get into issues with sulfur toxicity if it's too high. A lot of people, when they apply things like, you know, um, gypsum, um, you know, to, to add like a calcium mm -hmm. source, they, they mm -hmm. might apply too much sulfur and you know, they get into sulfur toxicity issues. So yours is pretty good. And, uh, you know, what we talked about before, uh, you can actually see some of this in the field. So um, deficiencies, symptoms of deficiency are very mm -hmm. obvious, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if it doesn't look deficient, you know, pretty obvious, uh, things like chlorosis, yellowing, purpling in the leaves. Yeah. And I would say it's pretty good. And your, your area is quite productive. I did not see any deficiencies or uh, any symptoms of any kind. So I, I'd say you're in the, in the optimal range for this. Cover crops are a little bit different though, uh, because it's, you know, you're trying to grow as much as possible for forage and also for the, the biomass, you know, as a nutrient source for the next crop. Right. Um, so it's, it is kind of variable, but as long, again, as you don't see any deficiency symptoms, I think you're pretty good. Yeah, if you're walking out there, folks, and your leaves are purple or yellow, or, or, you know, there's a problem in Motown. You need to do some testing here. Uh, we're talking about another episode, but you need to do some testing so you can correct that, so you can improve that. Because if you walk out in your field, folks, and everything's yellow or purple, the only reason a deer is eating that is because they're starving. That's like telling a deer to eat cardboard or something like that. So. You know, you want to see, you know, that dark green, you know, lush, what you would think of as a richly growing plant. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Green Cover Food Plots, Winchester, Lacrosse Footwear, Moultrie Mobile, Fleet Outdoor Apparel, Morel Targets, RTP Outdoors, Fourth Arrow, Hunt Stand, Scorpion Venom Archery, Case IH Tractors, Ward Laboratories, Burris Optics, National Land Realty, G5 Broadheads, Prime Bows, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. So going into the, to the soil health aspects so the respiration and some of the other water extractable components. Yeah. So the exciting thing, um, and I guess the first thing that we'll go through on the soil health side of things, um, your soil respiration, like Patrick said, so we do a 24 hour CO2 um, respiration test. Um, and normally um, if you're low, it's 60 or under respirations, um, sufficient is 60 to 120, and then high is 120 or greater. Grant, yours was at 262.6. <laughs> yeah. No wonder you kept most of that rainfall. Yeah. <laughs> that is it. That is high. That is, that is great. Um, so that's, that's what we want to see. Yeah, that's some pretty active soil. Yeah. So, and that's just an approximate, just because it gives you like a broad idea of like sure. how active the soil is. Yeah, so that, yeah. that's perfect. Mm -hmm. And then, so the water extractable organic carbon and um, organic nitrogen, this is typically like the food for the microbes. So uh, this is what they can access and kind of shows uh, uh, not just what they're eating, but also the nitrogen that's available that they can convert to things like nitrate and ammonium for the plants to take up uh, from the organic nitrogen. Uh, this typically just depends on the range. So um, for your organic carbon, 
the high end is above 240. You're about 131, which is in about the average range, which is pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to see. It's also a function of the, the crop residue, um, but you don't have a lot of residue at the moment. I mean, you're just kind of like naturally cycling things. So it's going to be kind of like an even keel sort of uh, steady state, which is perfect. Yeah, we're planting summer release right now because the microbes over the winter have about consumed all of the last year's crop that was laying on the ground. So we're planting summer release called planting green, you know, in, into it. And then we're getting ready to crimp all that standing stuff over and we're gonna you know increase that soil coverage and all that stuff food for the microbes my underground herd we're going to increase that significantly here as we speak yep exactly. yeah you'll see a lot of that starting to come off as they uh you know they become more active i'd, I'd say yeah. yeah with the residue so and then the water extractable that's total and then organic nitrogen for the organic um you're at 11 which is a little on the low end, but it's a, it's between a sufficient and low. Uh, again, this is just a function of the residue and sort of the activity of the system, um, but it's gonna be whatever the system needs. It's not gonna oversupply the nitrogen. Yeah. Um, so it's also a function uh, of the cropping system. If you have a lot of rye, which is a high carbon plant, uh, you'll, you'll see a little bit lower nitrogen levels yep. because you know legumes will release more nitrogen. Sure. Then also the microbes need more of that nitrogen to kind of work on that carbon in the rye. So. It's uh, just kind of a snapshot of what's going on currently in your system. Man, this is so cool. And we could go on for hours because I'm so into this. But let me just summarize and you tell me if I got this right or wrong. So, you know, we now kind of know how to read this and how this applies. And now I'm understanding why I need to do the SHA or the soil health assessment because there's so much more than just NPNK. And that's the results we're seeing on my property is all these other things working together. We've actually grown soil. We produce soil on top of the rocks through the years. And, and y'all can do that. Wherever you are, wherever you're listening, you can do that too. It doesn't happen overnight. Some people, oh gosh, I did that one year and I'm not seeing a difference. It, it's taken me years. It doesn't happen overnight. But now in these high fertilizer prices, high lime prices, high herbicide prices, I don't need to buy any of that based on this. I mean, I'm good to plant my next crop. I'm just, which we are, we're just drilling through and cripping. We're just planting seed and some tractor time is my expense. So, you know, that's really great. So I want everyone to take away, make sure that A, my soils are better than those guys in Iowa. B. No, according to your soil, soil health score, it's actually really one of the highest ones I've seen. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, B, you can do this. You don't have to be in Nebraska. You can do this anywhere. Uh, and you get this type of support over a phone. May not be a Zoom call, but you know you're going to get some great support. And you need to really use this soil health assessment, folks, because there's so much more than most labs I've worked with telling you, hey, NP and K you need to put a few hundred pounds of 10, 10, 10 out there. You're missing the boat, and you're staying in this cycle of just needing to add more, add more, add more, and my soil's not getting any better. The name of the game is lower inputs and lower, you know, lower management uh, other than the cover cropping system and, you know, uh, everything you have to do with that. Uh, but really, it's like you said, you know, everything's there. Um, you just have to see that it's there. And uh, the soil health assessment will actually show you all the different pieces of there, the physical, the chemical and the microbial. Uh, to kind of give you an overall idea of what's going on, not just the MPK, like you said. And for those folks that are just starting, we call it the lease release process. I, I think of it as I'm releasing the you know, creation's potential. It was here. We've kind of monkeyed it up in a few places by putting in a bunch of synthetic inputs and disking and whatnot, but we can still recover it. My place was a burnout cattle ranch. I mean, it was all gravel over graze, literally cow skeletons because they'd starved to death. I'd never, it's just so embarrassing to say, but I have never worked a property in my 31 years that had more dead, nor, more cow skeletons out there than my own land. And cows would not starve to death here now. Matter of fact, we're chasing my neighbor's cows that got through the fence because they, they want to be over here versus on his overgrazed pasture. So, so good. I want to thank you all so much for teaching me this and therefore teaching others this. And I can't wait to get you back. We're going to hopefully have you down this time in the summer and we'll take some clippings of the crop we're planting now and seeing how it's doing midstream, so to speak. Is, is that true? Is that correct? Yep, that's correct. Yeah, that is, that is correct. Yeah, I'm We're excited ex to see. Yeah, very excited to see. So Mick, Patrick, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I uh, can't wait for you to come back to, you know, the Proving Grounds here. And again, folks, this is available to you. These and others. I met Ryan. I've talked to a few more at the lab there. Uh, just super helpful folks. And 
This all helps us reduce our inputs of those synthetic products, herbicides, you know, fungicides, insecticides, which some of that always just, it just does, it leaches through the soil and ends up in our groundwater, our ponds, and our lakes. And as we say at Bass Pro, you know, we all live downstream of someone. So the cleaner we can keep it and the cleaner we can help our neighbors upstream keep it, it just helps everyone. Exactly. Yep, yep. That's right. Your place is totally pristine and I think it's great to keep it that way. We're excited <laughs> to come back. Well, we'll look forward to it. Hey, I, I want to thank everyone for tuning in today. And as always, use this to learn more about creation and even more important in understanding the soil test. Just make sure you take time to be quiet every day and seek the creator's will for your life. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.